What's up, everybody? Today on the Yours Truly podcast, we have Jeremy Firth in the virtual studio. Some of you might already know Jeremy from Paul Vanderclay's Friday live stream discussions or from Grail Country's live streams, where he participates occasionally. This is what it means to start playing in the corner here in our little corner of the internet. And I'm glad to be a part of helping facilitate this in the YouTube space. Jeremy and I first connected during a live stream chat on Luke Thompson's Grail Country. He asked about me if I would be interested in practicing some conversation craft here over on yours truly. I pointed him towards my email and soon after received a message with the intriguing subject line, Mormon to Taoist to atheist to orthodox. Here's part of what Jeremy wrote. Christian, I think we could have a really interesting conversation because we come from very different realms within a broad definition of Christianity. And it sounds like we both got disillusioned along the way. Well, Jeremy, I definitely think there's truth to that sentiment, and I'm excited to see where our conversation takes us today. I'm looking forward to hearing about and sharing your story with the yours truly faithful out here. So without further delay, I give you Jeremy Firth. Hi, this is Christian Baxter, and you're listening to Yours Truly, a place we go to think out loud. Jeremy, good morning. Good morning. Your right. intro feels like a Christian radio from like the 90s. It's great. Well, dude, that's like the deep <laughs> inside of me. That's, well, that's, it, it sounds like prepubescent Christian as well. Oh, <laughs> you you and Grim giving me hell about my... <laughs> he's like, I can't imagine yeah. Jocko Willink listening to a welcome <laughs> for yours truly, a place we... <laughs> Yeah. Focus on the family with Christian. <laughs> I, I come by it honestly. It's man, you know, uh, James Dobson reigned supreme in the uh, south of the United States. So there you go. Well, and it's in your name, right? Like you can't get away from it. You're never going to get away from being Christian. <laughs> right. I, I had like an eighth grade English teacher say, Christian, Christian, hmm, that's a hard name to live up to. You know? <laughs> yeah. I ended yeah. up well. Thankfully, mercy comes before judgment. In, oh, there you go. Right. <laughs> like, there's a there's a song about that that I really like. So, um, man, yeah. Well, I'm glad you like reached out, and that's the thing. This is this is very much, um, I as you probably are discovering, it's it's about whatever you want to put into it. You know. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, so, yeah, here we are. And. Well, and I've enjoyed seeing you come on onto the scene quick. You know, you're getting up to speed and and uh, interviewing a lot of interesting people, and and you 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 you're taking just a very open and genuine approach. Uh, just and I, I listened to that video you shared with me, talking about your life story, and it sounds like uh, everything got burned down, and uh, you had to kind of rebuild from scratch. And and I've been through a very similar path uh, along very similar lines, honestly. So. Well, let's hear it, man. Well, uh, okay. So, uh, grew up Mormon mostly. My stepmom was Baptist, so I went to. I've been to a few Baptist services. Had friends who were, you know, born again, and went to some Pentecostal churches, seeing some of that stuff. Uh, but always fell back into Mormonism. They had this one. So, so when I was 11, we actually had the missionary discussions because I hadn't been baptized at that point. My, my, my parents got divorced and my mom and they, they were both Mormon, but neither of them practiced. And then when my mom got remarried, she started getting into it again. So that's when I got exposed and they had this like presentation. It was their eschatology, basically where we came from, why we're here, where we're going after we die. And it was a very compelling story. And it just like everything had a place and everyone landed in a place and it made sense to me. And, and, uh, and I really, I was sold at that point at the age of 11, I was convinced <laughs> by their story. So I, I was, I was very into it. I, you know, we got up every morning, studied the scriptures. Um, there was a, there's a program called early morning seminary. So I was in an area where, you know, like in Utah, they just have a one period during the day where they go over to seminary, but, where I was living, I was in Nevada at the time. I just got up for a while. I got up with my mom and we were studying the scriptures together. And then, you know, they had like a curriculum 
and then they kind of organized a little group and I started joining the group and anyway, exposed to asceticism very early, basically like Mormon life at that time was really, it was ascetic, you know, it was, they, they asked a lot of their members. Um, you know, I was in church two or three times a week and church service on Sunday was three hours. You know, we had three different hours of, I mean, we had three hours of services on Sunday and, um, you know, and then a meeting Sunday night or a meeting Saturday night and a meeting Wednesday. And, you know, it was, I was in church a lot. And I liked it. I, I enjoyed it. I read scriptures and was totally into it. But the problem was that the Mormons take the, uh, they bought into the whole um, fundamentalism versus mo modernism argument in the early 1900s and came down firmly on the fundamentalist side of, you know, literal historical. The, the, the whole problem with that argument is that it adopts the modernism framing and then tries to argue using the tools of modernism on why the Bible is relevant. And it's just, it, it doesn't hold water, at least in my opinion, it doesn't, it didn't work for me at all. I just, it seemed very silly, you know? And then you get in this argument of like, was Noah a real person? And you're like, oh, geez, you know, it's like, how do you even know? Like, how do you, you can't, you can't prove that one way or another. That's just stupid, you know? Mm -hmm. and so, you know, and the Book of Mormon takes the same approach. Like right in the intro to the Book of Mormon, it says this is a literal history of the people in Central and you know in the Americas in the from 600 BC to 480, and it, it makes that direct claim. I think they've backed off on that a little bit since then, but uh, at that time they even used the word literal again yeah. to the grin of Jonathan Pedro. But uh, <laughs> but anyway. Uh, so you know, I went on a mission. I was a missionary, uh, which is again a, a really great introduction to asceticism. Um, you know, we get up at six thirty every morning, out the door by nine a.m., and then stay out until nine p.m. Knocking on doors, talking to people. It was uh, six and a half days a week. I had a half a day a week where it was called preparation day, and we could kind of take care of the things that need to be taken care of, like laundry and haircuts and stuff. But other than that, I was talking to people, knocking on, going to people's houses for dinner, talking about Christ, you know? And, uh, but I came home and things got a little rocky and, you know, the hormones start waking back up. I mean, they never went to sleep, but, uh, you know, but uh, what happened was then I started, I was uh, in contact with a girl who I'd met in college and uh, she was on a mission when I got home. And then when she got home, you know, I started taking my faith more seriously again and got in a relationship with her and got married. Uh, but three years into that, you know, I came from a very chaotic childhood. Like I moved around a lot and uh, I moved between my parents and my parents would move. So I went to 15 schools in 12 years. Yeah, it was brutal. It was, it was brutal. So I didn't know how to have long-term relationships. I didn't know how to have a long-term, you know, I didn't know how to resolve things in relationships. I just left, you know. Hmm. so that did not go well be so because of that i was kind of tuned to chaos like i saw chaos as normal well i got in a marriage with a very loving woman who was very loyal very humble brilliant uh she's now a, a university professor uh and very successful and um we were starting to build a life together and it was, we were living in a neighborhood and building community and active in the church. And, uh, and I had a stable job and I was really enjoying my job and progressing well, and she was progressing well. And it terrified me. Honestly, yeah. I, I didn't know how to handle it. I was just like, it felt like a trap. It felt like I used the phrase, I was living a scripted life. I was living someone else's life. I felt like I had been going through the motions and I need to be me. And it was the whole authenticity kind of spirit and, and the Promethean spirit, I think it's alive in me. Uh, and, and, and honestly, what broke me, I think was when the matrix came out mm. that movie, uh, I watched it seven times in the theater. Yeah. I'm enamored. Uh, it, you know, it's kind of a, it's not looking back. It's, it's kind of weird and all over the place and kind of hodgepodgey, but it was the, the Gnostic messaging really slipped through 
my filters and started really kind of working <laughs> behind the scenes. So I got involved in martial arts because I, I was like, well, this is, this is real. This is like embodied spirituality. And I saw martial arts that way. And so I, I wanted that because I didn't have that in church. Yeah. Right? Like church was not embodied church was, we go into this room and you know, it's this, the, the same, uh, argument that spiritual spiritual people use you know oh you, why don't why are you going in this room to talk about god with people who have never met him when you could just sit in nature and be with god and i started so i wanted a more embodied spirituality and uh and so i went to martial arts and that started really undermining my faith in christianity because i started having spiritual experiences in meditation you know and uh and I, they were undeniable so um i had an affair and i left my wife and i left my church i was literally excommunicated and and i left my job all in the same week oh yeah i left my career you know i i left everything i burned it all down and uh and felt like I wanted to rebuild it from scratch you know, more, you know, now at the time and looking, I mean, now I can't say it was a mistake, but it was a huge mistake that I, I married the person I had an affair with. That was a huge mistake. Like my wife was willing to reconcile mm. and I, I refused and mm. left and I wasn't planning on marrying the woman I had an affair with. I was ready to just go my own way. And the woman I had an affair with kind of tracked me down and was like, no, let's, I'm willing to leave my husband too. Let's get married. So that all happened very fast. Um, I think I left my wife in April and I moved in with my soon to be new wife in August. And in October we were married. So it was just like, it was crazy. And she had two daughters and, um, man, that was just a huge mistake because mm. I, I was really in the middle of a lot of turmoil. And now all of a sudden I'm a stepfather and I am a husband and I have to try to, and I didn't really have a career. I had to build something from scratch, you know? So I, I was in video production at the time. So I was doing all kinds of like gig work and, yeah. you know, just trying to make the ends meet and really having a hard time. And, and finally got kind of hooked up with a local wedding video company and started shooting and editing for them. And, and uh, was able to, and then I got involved in the poker industry because I answered an ad on Craigslist. And so then I went down the road of gambling and learning about gambling and probability and got a gambling addiction and yeah. my life started falling apart more and, and uh, you know, became more secular. And, and, and honestly, it was really interesting. I had a kind of a deconstruction of even my Eastern, like I got involved in new age at that time, that stuff. And I'm, I'm talking for a long time. I'm sorry. You can stop. That's all right. Yeah, go for yeah. it. I'm trying to just catch up. Um, I'm catching up to my 47 years of life. Uh, but but I, 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 my my faith, even in Eastern stuff, got deconstructed because I listened to a talk by um, Dr. Jill Bolte Taylor. And it was really interesting because she's a Harvard psychiatrist or a Harvard um, neuroscientist who had a stroke on the left side of her brain, like in her 30s or an aneurysm, sorry, she had an aneurysm. And um, so she lost the functionality of her left brain. And the experiences that she was talking about, like she regained her ability to speak and it took years of therapy, but she was giving us a TED talk back when those were cool. Yeah, I remember and, that, I listened to that one. Oh, okay. So yeah, so what happened, so she's talking about all these experiences that she's having without her left brain. And she's talking about like feeling like, a whale swimming in this cosmic ocean and that she's connected to everything and all. And I was like, well, these are the experiences I've had in meditation. So that means this spirituality stuff is just a function of my bright, bright brain. And that, then I went right back into materialism. So I went from my materialist Mormon upbringing through new age, starting getting into Taoism. Then, and then, and then she just pulled me right back into materialism. And and that's when the new atheist movement was going on with the whole 
Sam Harris, Richard Dawkins thing. I gave my niece like the God delusion when she was like 15. I feel like it's terrible. Mm. So anyway, that, that deconstructed everything. And I became an ardent new atheist. I was all about it. And, um, and then my life continued to fall apart as a result. My relationships got more and more strained, um, more affairs, both sides of the relationship, um, pornography, addiction, gambling addiction, everything's falling apart. And, uh, actually kind of ended up splitting with my wife. We weren't officially separated, but kind of was, um, where I, I went up to Seattle to work for my sister and my family stayed here in Utah so that they could, so that my daughter could finish the school year. And, um, man, that was harrowing and I was alone and I was facing what it would be like to be alone. And I was like, this sucks, mm. <laughs> right? Like, this is not good. I got to fix this. I got to fix my marriage. I got to fix the relationship with my daughter. My daughter was going into a dark path. You know, she was getting into witchcraft and getting into the whole woke mindset. And, you know, I was just terrified. And, uh, that's when Jordan Peterson, you know, I, I watched his video talking about free speech and then I was mm -hmm. like, who's this guy? And, uh, Jordan Peterson really his lectures on the Bible reopened my mind to looking at the scriptures in a new way. And I had never heard anyone talk about the scriptures the way he did. And, uh, you know, cause he's just like, I'm going to put the historicity aside. I don't even want to talk about that. It doesn't really matter. Let's talk about it from a scientific point of view. And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you could do that. Like I, I had never heard another approach to the scriptures, to be honest with you. You know, I had heard the literalist approach and then I heard the deconstruction of that. Yep. And that's it. Well, there's a whole different, there's the narrative approach and it's turns out, then you get introduced to Jonathan Peugeot and you start looking at the world in this new way. And I, I remember calling Paul Vanderclay, um, cause he said at that time, it was like his channel was tiny. He's like, look, you know, I'm, I pastor of a small church. If you need to talk, like call me, it's fine. And I called him one time, just kind of having a crisis of like, because my materialism was falling apart <laughs> Yeah, and it was scaring me. Like I felt I was going crazy because I couldn't really complain. I couldn't communicate it to other people, what I was learning or what I was learning to see, but I, I couldn't let, hold on to materialism. And, uh, and he was just like, you know, look, these things are, it's difficult and it takes time. Like be patient with yourself. You're not right. going to figure this out overnight. Just, just take your time and work your way through it. Find a community and be a part of it. You know, and I ended up going to Orthodox church and the first time the priest came out, I don't know if you've been to a divine liturgy, but the first time the priest came out, you know, there's this one part where he just goes peace be with you all you know and he blesses the, the the parish and and they respond you know and with thy spirit and man i was just like what was that <laughs> like something happened right like something mm -hmm. in my heart where i was just like that something that's it was very moving to me it's like such a simple gesture but he just comes out and blesses the crowd and and it just went right in Peace. that was the arrow i mean everything that i heard yeah. in your story was the opposite yeah, that's when right. Someone's like saying, like, I mean, I mean, that makes me think of Christ on the boat. Peace, be still, wind, waves, water, the chaos. Yep. And you yep. were did that. And I have, you know, a, a friend of mine recently, we were talking about worship in the church, and and he was pointing to this book about um middle ages worship like what was going on during the reformation because you know we like to think of it it's just like you know these like <laughs> light switch type thing it wasn't it's right. just like, and it's drawn uh, out over yeah, here, and, right? but yeah. He, yeah he said um that the passing of the peace actually because i guess there was a season where even the the congregants didn't even take communion sometimes mm -hmm. it was just uh like the priest would be doing it or something mm -hmm. i don't know yeah, but that the passing of the peace, and sometimes they would maybe like pass a icon or a cross around, or but like that that actually became the most holy for a season. That that was the the passing of peace was like the most holy part of worship. Mm. I don't know that's just what that kind of spoke to me when you when you were sharing that moment, that profound moment. Um, it's it's worship's interesting in that sometimes 
things hit us from different ways and it doesn't it's like that's like you know when for the people that were already going to church they're like probably were just you know like trying to like find their stuff or get in there so yeah yeah and peace we be with you in the spirit and stuff and you were like having this <laughs> yeah yeah i was having a moment it was like so, all right like so you, orthodox you liturgy is very confusing it's very yeah. different than anything i had been exposed to in mormonism right mormonism is very protestant you know it's the bare walls white room you know yeah. one on a pulpit and it's not you know the mormonism is unique in that it's all lay pastor it's all lay ministry and and everyone who speaks is you know very rarely a, a church leader and the church leaders are not professional they're not paid right they don't have paid clergy it's all just volunteers so you're just hearing other people from your congregation speaking yeah so so when you go in and there's a priest and there's a hierarchy and there's the you know it looks <laughs> forgive me it looks like the cuckoo clock i mean that's where the cuckoo clocks come from you know with the mm -hmm. little, you know the thing comes yeah. out you know it's like that's related there's a reason why those clocks look like that right it's like the rotations around the around the altar yeah, yeah. but uh it was it's beautiful and I, I i felt like there was something really meaningful there and and my you know my wife and i went on that journey together and mm. i was baptized a little before she was but she did join with me and you know we've we had issues even after we joined like you know it takes time to kind of turn the ship but we had a structure we had a framework to work yeah. with, and, and we had a higher power to surrender to both of us right it wasn't a power struggle anymore because our whole marriage had been a power struggle yeah and once we surrendered that to christ you know it everything changed that's an interesting statement that you know your marriage is a power struggle when it, and and in a materialist mindset your whole, your whole life is a power struggle just with you yeah like because you're, you're god at that point yeah yeah and well my nickname online was prometheus for mm -hmm. years my nickname when i was a missionary was lucifer <laughs> trying to bring I, the light <laughs> i had the, yeah i had that revolutionary spirit and that that pride spirit of like well you know i i stumbled into this i said it accidentally I, well not accidentally but i had never thought of it before there was somebody in the chat who was talking about for me it was some gnostic showed up you know and he was talking about how oh judas was actually the most chosen apostle he was the most obedient one i was like oh, we've heard this before too but uh but one of the things he was talking to like, like prometheus and lucifer you know and i was like well the the you have to be really careful i was like the spirit of prometheus is the spirit of grasping up into the future and trying to pull it down into the present Mm. you know and i i was really always trying to do that i was trying I to with that. yeah i was trying to like when i was younger i was always wanting to be older i was always acting older i was always trying to be mature i was always trying to act older than i was i didn't want to be recognized for my age and you know and that included the sins too right like i was always ahead of where i was right like my sins were always in somewhere else so and that spirit and then you know the whole matrix that's what the matrix is that that movie is all about the promethean spirit of everything you see here is an illusion and reality is you know above this and and is spiritual and this is all just fake and games you know and it's like, mm. and so yeah it it uh it took a long time to be able to recognize that and recognize the danger of it and understand that and and it it only has started really becoming clear, you know, through the Orthodox lens, through the Christian lens of being able to understand that that we are we're warring with powers and principalities, right? And I think Orthodoxy really helped me understand that better than any 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 approach that Mormonism took to that concept. You know? Sorry, my computer. Oh, that's all right. <laughs> now you got the big white box behind you. Oh, there we go. I don't know what it's going to do. Give me just a second here. And we're back. Sorry about that. That's all right. So Gotta we, have the branding. Gotta have the branding. Right. <laughs> like the computer had to re reboot. We were sitting here waiting on like a loading bar going across. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, man, tell me. Well, we had the really cool conversation while we were gone. That was great. Thank you. Yeah, uh, you're welcome. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. saying. No, I'm just saying that was the end where there's nothing else to talk about. Oh, that's right. It's all <laughs> and that, that was just the... Uh, that was just the the point where I was, you know, sharing when you talked about, you know, 
having betrayal in your marriage and, the, and I was bringing that up when we were off camera, but if you've been hanging around this podcast, you know that that's been a part of my journey and my story of life. And we were, you know, um, connecting on, on the pain of, of betrayal, the pain of, of being the betrayer and the the train, the pain of being betrayed. And so, yeah, well, and, and I, I was going to say like the, the hard part about that is that it, you you talked about this in another video I watched of, of a conversation that you had with the the uh, Scandinavian guy I can't remember his name forgive me uh, Lucas yeah Lucas um, he you you were saying you finally had to confront who you really were rather yeah. than the narrative that you had built for yourself right like and I had done the same thing I was like the nice guy I was the you know, I was nice guy. I was like that book, like no more Mr. Nice guy. I was Mr. Nice guy, but it's, it's the, there's that, un, the dark underlying part of that nice guy mindset is a tra very transactional view of relationships and love. Right. And, and I'm going to, this is, I have to put this back onto Mormonism because they have a scripture in there in their scriptures that says every blessing in heaven is a result of obedience to the law on which it is predicated. That's transactional <laughs> love from God, right? And transactional blessings. And that that is the foundation of Mormon theology. Mm. Uh, it's you really are appeasing God with your acts and and sacrifices. And then if he, you know, then he he gives you blessings as you're obedient and it's a horrible foundation for a relationship. I will tell you that. Yeah. Yeah. That transactionality is the, it's the cancer that was eating all of my relationships. Right. Cause how do you have a transactional relationship with a child? <laughs> how do you do that? What do you get out of having a baby? Like what is the transactional? <laughs> relationship and having a baby there's none which is why the modern people aren't right like everyone's optimizing now i yeah. think that's the real disease of our time is optimizing like everyone's optimizing i've got to be doing the best thing i gotta be reading the best thing i gotta be doing the best morning routine approved by dr huberman and science and right like i have to be optimizing my time and every moment's got to be filled with the optimal thing of what i need to be optimally doing for my optimal outcome of my optimal life and you can't even really define that but everybody's obsessed with it well i, I heard you um on luke's stream well, we, we were both in there yesterday or the day before, whenever it was, and and you were talking about in your job. I think you're a welder by trade. Well, I was. Yeah, oh, I, I was a welder, and now I'm a it. stupid Excel guy. <laughs> well, you know, it's a the the, uh, the air conditioning's better, probably. But <laughs> yeah, true, it is. Yeah, but I've got I've gained forty pounds too, so it's so, a surprise. <laughs> so, but but on on being in that business and you were talking about the difference between manufacturing and fabrication. I thought that right. was, I, I didn't know that when you talked about that it was pretty insightful for me, but you, what you're hitting on right now, talking about the optimization is like this manufactured, uh, make a continue to see the human person as more machine than as yeah. whatever this, whatever it means to be human versus the opposite of, or, you know, the machine and, and that we can optimize. And, and again, there's like, there probably there is a like you talked about being overweight or something yeah it, it'll be unhealthy like there is mm -hmm. optimal health but yeah but yeah. we make that when we when we we try to make we put that in a an unhealthy place sometimes you know like this trying to to, to control our lives in such a when when we when i think that when i think i have more joy or peace is whenever i try to just respond to something good and true you know like respond mm -hmm. to a good relationship or mm -hmm. something like that versus i have to you know make this thing happen and i don't know if that well and the problem i see is that you get competing optimisms that's mm -hmm. what happens right like you're optimizing for if you're optimizing for health 
you can ruin your relationships by being in the gym too much and by being obsessed with food and not being able to go out to eat with your family or not being able, you know, you mm -hmm. go to someone's house that you're visiting and you like bring your menu of what you're, oh, yeah. what you can eat, right? Like if you, so, so if you, so then what happens is people become very scattered trying to optimize for different areas of their life and those things compete and they don't really have a hierarchy. Yeah, there it's individual optimization over everything. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Yeah. And that's what ruins that's what's ruined dating for people, right? right? They're always trying to optimize for this transactional like what's best for me? Like what do I need in a relationship? Like who is the best person for me and what am I what are they doing for me and are they meeting my needs? And dude, that is a poison. Oh my gosh. And that goes back to the I don't know if we were off camera talking about the transactional nature of relationships when you, yeah. talk, but the, um, I don't know. So I guess let's try to like catch up, you catch your story back up and then kind sure. of, like you were wanting to talk about worship, I think. And that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so, so anyway, I, yeah, my, we joined the Orthodox church four years ago, my wife and I did. Um, and, and now my whole life's been transformed. Um, I'm part of a parish. I love my parish. I love the people in my parish. I'm the treasurer in my parish, so I have a very active role. Uh, and and I have a wonderful priest, but I, I can't tell him that because it would ruin it. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but no, I it's a it's amazing to be part of a community. I feel like a lot of the people who are there have a very similar kind of seeker wandering through the wilderness uh, story that. And then you find, you know, the platform nine and three quarters one day where someone just points at the brick wall and goes right through there. And you're like, what? <laughs> and it's been hiding in plain sight the whole time. And all of a sudden you go through there and you're in divine liturgy. Uh, that was a Harry Potter me. reference for everybody out there. It took me like 10 seconds to catch up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I try to slip it in for younger people because you guys usually like that's the religion of millennials. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> there's some there's some truth buried in there yeah yeah but yeah no it's it's a it's a it's an apt reference i think it's i think it's it fits where uh orthodoxy in america really feels like the the it's the hidden gem hidden in plain sight right mm -hmm. uh, for me that's what it's been it's been transformational in that it's an embodied worship and it's what 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 it did for me and what I realized is that I was very much in my left brain and trying to orient to the world only with my left brain and discounting my right brain and yeah. distrusting it. And Orthodox, you go in and you stand in divine liturgy and your left brain's like, what is that? What does that mean? Why is he doing that? What is he doing? Why did they do that? Why did they go there? What is that? Why are they doing that? And there's no answer, right? There's no one to like stand next to you and be like, Hey, what was that? What was that? And, and even if you did like, that would be really disruptive. Like everyone's standing silently. And, and so then your left brain just gets tired and then it just shuts up. And then all of a sudden this beauty shows up and this peace shows up and you're like, Oh, <laughs> this is all. And then the choir is like, our choir is really good. Cause, cause a lot of people in our parish are former Mormons and Mormons are all about like, the performing arts, you know, like musical theater in Utah is phenomenal, like Broadway level musical yeah. theater in Utah. And, uh, and so a lot of them are former Mormons who have really great voices. And so our choir is like on point. And, uh, and so like everything about that is just, it, it, it showed me how blind I was and how much I discounted beauty and ornamentation uh you know i was an iron rand libertarian modernist you know <laughs> so my whole right brain had been basically cut off uh, it's like i'd been lobotomized yeah it's interesting because a lot of people make assumptions about me as being a musician as being probably more right-brained mm. um and i think that there's it's a complicated story part of it's just the nature of our culture mm -hmm. um but that i've never felt like a very creative person mm -hmm. uh different in different ways at different times but the reason was because i um i would look at something like what somebody was doing in this culture 
musically and I'd just be like, I just want to copy it. Mm -hmm. I'm not interested in, and I don't even think that I could do anything as good as that. So why try? And so, because so I, that's like denying like your person in a way just to be mm-hmm. like, and then let's, let's follow this thing and get it down to a science. Like let's follow, like um, let's this yeah. formula. And um, now, and so I've been having to reconstruct, reconstruct my relationship with music during this mm-hmm. journey too. Um, the, I love the relational aspect of, of being in a band and in working mm-hmm. with people. Mm-hmm. But I, but when it came to the music, I, I was like, um, my value for the execution was misplaced. It was too high mm-hmm. in a way that, that took away from, I don't, I don't even know from being able to be present in, um, in the state of trying to lead music or be a part of music with people i was so focused on executing music yeah i don't know and and yeah, and, uh, yeah. Um, you're a performer not a not an artist yes and and i think that i have some artistic stuff but i've had to i'm still having to like um well catch up to it and yeah. uh and and be open to it in ways and i think this journey is helping me actually in these conversations and, and just the, even just trying to follow a type of um, openness to not controlling who I'm trying to talk to, or just like, let Mm. it like be more creative, more open. Organic. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that's not how I've approached a lot of things. Um, Mm. It's been a lot of high control. So, um, so I hear you on that. Uh, So it sounds like, it's interesting on a couple of things that you said where, you know, he talked about getting remarried and how not reconciling you feel like was actually a mistake. Is that a conversation within y'all's marriage? I mean, you're saying it out loud here, but that's a, that might be for people sometimes to hear, like you're still with this person, but you called that, a, or you said it was a mistake not to reconcile. Like, um, yeah. So th- yeah, it's, this is a complicated, right? So, so I was originally married for those three years to a beautiful person yeah. and didn't know how to handle being loved that way and how to handle a stable life. Yeah. So I left her and was willing to be reconciled or she wanted to reconcile and I didn't. And then I got married to the person that I had an affair with. And that's just, the recipe for chaos because what is the foundation of that of mar- that how is that a foundation for marriage how is betrayal a foundation for marriage mm. that's insane right like that's how backwards i was that's how it's 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 a um it's very much a um a very short-sighted very you know delusional state uh, like i i really think you know the there are deeper spirits at work in Gnosticism than people like to talk about. And they, they grabbed me hook, line and sinker. Could you unpack what that means? Yeah. So, uh, I will just say, I, I, I think Gnosticism is a demonic inversion of Christianity and that demonic inversion completely demonically inverted my life to the point where my momentary moment to moment, like, mania that comes from adultery because it causes you to schism in your mind you have you have separate lives compartmentalize you have to depart compartmentalize you've become two people at least or maybe five people or ten people and and that in itself is not that's in itself is a demonic twist right and then to put it, it really is the Promethean spirit. It was the revolutionary spirit of whatever I need is most important and I'm going to do what's best for me and I'm just going to burn down my whole life and start over and I just need to, and you're completely disregarding any other relationship. You're completely disregarding any effect that you're having on anyone else in your life. You know, your parents are just looking at you like, what the hell are you doing? You know, you're my, my first wife was looking at me like, what, what is happening? What's going on? Right. And it, it really was just that, that spirit of cultivating, the 
the pride of just doing what I want to do and, and feeling like, Oh, I had never done that. Oh, I need to do that. Oh, that's going to make my life real and meaningful. And it really was just a delusional mania that I was in. And, and then, like you said, there's a time where it all falls apart and everything comes to light. And then you, you have, you're left on a crossroads and, and I doubled down <laughs> on that, that spiritual rebellion. Mm. And, and that was the mistake. Yeah. And, and I paid for it dearly and, and it continued to disrupt and harm all of my relationships with my family and with my friends and with my second wife and with her children. And then we had a child together. So with my own daughter, everything was strained by that doubling down on optimizing for myself. That's what I was doing. Yeah. And it ruins everything. It ruins everyone. And you don't see yourself. Like I saw myself as an Island, but I wanted to be connected. Right. Like I wanted people to accept me the way I was, but I, I didn't want to accept that I affected other people uh, or I didn't want to accept how I was affecting other people. Yeah. Because then you'd have to be responsible for it. Yeah. And I would have to change. Right. Yeah. And it was like that anti-authority kind of streak in me, like that libertarian, like you can't tell me what to do, you know, yeah. like don't tread on me. Right. <laughs> the Gadsden flag. I mean, it was, it was, it was just a, a juvenile way of working out my anti-authoritarian and, and the feelings of betrayal from my childhood. You know, my parents got divorced and that really just rocked my life. That just tore me apart. And then, you know, and I have ADHD and so there's all the shame that comes from ADHD, trying to live with ADHD with no medication, no really not even knowing what it was for a long time. You know, and all that stuff just stacked up, you know, and then a pornography addiction from the time of being like 10. So that affects how you see women and how your relationships as well. Right. So I mean, it was just a mess. Yeah. So on that part about the ADHD shame, mm -hmm. what, do you, what do you mean by that? Well, so I was just talking with my daughter and my wife about this yesterday. So like, so I'm on medication now and I, I can't tell you how much it changes my life because, because there are very, very basic things. And I'll give you an example just from yesterday. So yesterday, the chore was I need to load up my truck, load up the grass, the bags of grass, and take it to the dump and then get the truck filled up with mulch and come home. Sounds great, right? No problem. Easy. Go out. Truck's not starting. Oh, okay. So get in. I have a 1973 Chevy. So I know it inside and out. So I went in and quickly figured out that I had accidentally uh, pulled a wire apart. So anyway, I got that wire. So then I have to go get the toolbox and I bring it, bring it over. And then I have to go find a thing and I have to, you know, like it turns into like 10 steps to just get the truck to start. And then you get in the truck and it starts and then you go warm it up and you're, and then there's stuff in the back of my truck. So I have to unload that. And then, so there's water treatment salt. So I'm going to take the water treatment salt out. And I'm going to go in and I'm not just going to put it in the garage. I need to go put it. So then I, do it in the, I, I load the water treatment stall and I, and then like normally without medication way, way earlier than that, I would have gotten very frustrated and I would be like, forget it. I get so angry because you have a goal in mind and there's all these things that pop up in front of you that require your attention and it must be addressed before you can actually get to the thing that you want to do. And then you have the added frustration of trying to address those things by like going into a toolbox and you can't find the tool that you need and then going into the garage and you can't find the thing you need. And then you, so it's like all these frustrations la stack up and it's infuriating and you just want to go away. You don't want to do it anymore with medication. I can get through all of that and actually get to the dump. And so when you grow up and you encounter these frustrations and, you know, like with homework, you know, like, I scored a 32 on my ACT. Okay. So I knew how to take a test and I knew how to learn and I knew what they were saying in school. It was no problem. I could keep up and I can have a conversation at the same time. No problem. But homework, forget it. I graduated with a 2.5 GPA because homework felt like busy work to me. It was like, why? I can take a test. Why do I need to do your homework? So then my anti-authority 
kicks in too, right? So there's a shame of like, I'm really smart, but I can't do these easy things that most people find very easy. So something must be wrong with me. Mm. There is a character flaw. I have a character flaw. Something's deeply wrong. I don't know what it is. I can't find it, but it's wrong with me. Mm. And that's the shame. That's yeah. the shame that kicks in. You go, other people can do this stuff. People who I know are idiots can do things that I can't do. And then you get on medication and you're like, is it this easy for everybody? Is life this easy? What? Like it just, it was, it was, <laughs> I was really angry actually when I, the first time I got on medication, I was angry wow. for a little while because I was so angry at like how easy, how much easier life is and how, how much responsibility I had taken for something that really was not a character flaw, hmm. you know? And that also fed into the pornography addiction. That's the same, the same thing, which also fed into the gambling addiction, right? I guess I didn't mention that. Oh, yeah, I did. Yeah, you know, you, poker. yeah. yeah it's and, that shame. Shame is what feeds all no, addiction, in yeah, my opinion. It is. It's 100% because you do something and you can't, it, the shame is what inhibits you from talking. Yeah. From yeah. being on it. To, you might be, you know, because you know. Right. But that was, that was for me, the issue is like, you know, well, like me and God know, but nobody yeah, yeah. else does. And that's, and apparently that's not enough. And I think that's part of the embodied reality of, of faith and, and working that out and, and, uh, and sacrificing your pride or your ability to insulate yourself from the pain that comes from failure yes. uh, is is what that of, of facing that shame and it's um it's brutal man and you know that we yeah. talked about it. it's it's absolutely i mean it, 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 i felt like it killed me and it kind of did yeah. good you know? yeah it killed the parts of you that need to die yeah, yeah. and and that was yeah. and but it, it was continued it's been a continued process but uh, that initial process was so revelatory in um when you talked about walking into that church like the peace that mm -hmm. i that i came to from finally being honest and like was was a embodied piece and yeah, whenever yeah. the deceit wants to try to come back in it's like i can feel it mm -hmm. where i when you had operated when that space for so long and until you purged it until you came face to face with the truth and you were honest about it i i thought or i just knew that as existence um, yeah, that's a good and, way to put it yeah. and but after that purging, uh, I was like, I don't want that back. I don't want that that life back. And and the the power to overcome that came from stories I was told as a kid from this book <laughs> about this God and this person and. That this is a way, you know, like which I was all steeped in that. But the the thing was, it wasn't, um, it wasn't like you were talking about. Uh, it wasn't the literal history of it that gave it power. Right. right. You weren't living in the story. It was just in your head. Yeah. That's how it was for me. I, maybe I'm projecting. Well, it, I, I would say maybe at different times more than others. That's yeah, that, that's more fair to yourself. And to me, yeah, yeah, I can say the same, right? I mean, you don't go on a mission and stay there for two years without like participating in it at some level, right? Yeah. So tell um, me about your, tell me about how you, how Mormonism relates to your Christianity. Like, how does that, how does that work for you? Well, for me, I think it's the ascetic practices that really connect with orthodoxy. You know, uh, Mormons, when I was a kid, we would, you know, uh, you know, I, like I said, we had early morning seminary, all the church meetings, prayer, you know, family prayer, prayer before every meal. You know, prayer was a big part of our lives. Um, you know, prayer is very different for me now than it was then. But, uh, but, uh, you know, and actually that's related to music. I'll go down that road. I think you might find it interesting. You know, sure. Mormons are all very much like, they say, uh, you know, avoid vain repetitions. Well, they think any repetitive prayer is a vain repetition, right? And yeah. it's like, well, no, there's that word vain. <laughs> right? That's a pretty big modifier. 
you know, and, and I, I kind of stumbled into an analogy one time about music. So, you know, my, somebody was asking me about doing prayers out of a prayer book. And I was like, well, the way I understand is that prayer, like your heart is the instrument of prayer, right? Your heart is what you, use. like you, you we're really called to get into our heart to pray. And when you're first trying to do that, you, so, it, so I'll just use the musical instrument analogy. So when you're first learning to play a musical instrument, you don't just, someone doesn't just hand you a guitar and say, okay, play, uh, Wonderwall, right? <laughs> so you don't, you, you can't, you can't, right? You can't, you don't know what to do. You don't know how it works. You don't know how it's structured. So the first thing you do is you find a little song. Maybe you learn some scales. You learn the basic structures. You learn three chords and you learn the first song of three chords, right? And, and as you're doing that, as you're developing and you're learning musical theory and then music's becoming a part of you and you're becoming embodied in music, all of a sudden you start feeling these little, hmm, these little fountains spring up and you go oh maybe i could try a little and i'll add a little and i'll add you know and this is a cool song but i'm gonna change and i'm gonna and you start becoming involved and participating in it and then maybe you may write a song or two and it's because you've learned how to play the instrument that then you can improvise and start to modify and, and be creative with it and but it required that foundation but even when you are at that point where you're writing your own songs you're not than stopping playing all other music written by other people, right? It's you, you continue to play songs and you continue to explore those other modalities that you wouldn't be exposed to otherwise by participating in someone else's music by playing their music, right? Like that transforms you. And, and I, I think the same thing can be said of prayer with written prayers. Like when you're saying prayers that were, not they were written by holy men and women and they've been prayed tens of thousands or, or hundreds of thousands or millions of times by holy people over hundreds or thousands of years there's a lot of power in that there's a lot of power in that that is a you are participating in something that a lot of people have participated in and your heart's yes. coming into that place yes and even when you get to a point where you start adding a few things at the end of your prayers, a few people, you know, that you want to pray for specifically falling back on that tradition, I think is powerful. It's been transformative to my spirituality. I agree. Um, relating that to music. I've, I've talked with Lance about that. Um, Lance um, Cleaver and uh, that he feels he's had a similar experience with prayer in orthodoxy. And, uh, I have, uh, the way I connect to it is that doing call and responses in worship and reading the creed or doing corporate confessions together in a simple mm -hmm. liturgy, actually, I recognized was something completely different than having just music. Mm -hmm. And there's a couple of pieces and my experience comes from it, uh, corporately and then down it's, it's filtered down into the private versus maybe some people starting well uh, let me try to i'll try to get there so i realized that there's the like saying a creed to the you know like the apostles creed together as a church when you you're hearing other people and you are saying i mean you're saying this like you talk it's something attached that's you know um over a thousand years old so like there, there's that aspect of it. You're also doing something um, where you're participating with the saints and the and the brothers and sisters from all of history of in that uh, who have joined in that before. Yep. Um, and and then if you are able to memorize it. Uh, memorize something that's that's powerful i actually sometimes use it in prayer just because yeah. it's just because it's memorized and yeah. and uh and then obviously like the lord's prayers is another one and yeah. I, and i've started i don't know a lot of the jesus prayer but um i've started using that as a rhythm to get into the to prayer yeah. um 
and the the embodied nature like you're saying um as you were talking about that i've got my my drum set over here in the corner and um drums isn't something i've ever done a whole lot of live but i've been playing since about 15 16 my dad had a kit in the house and and i can get in i can just press a song on and i can play along with it and have a lot of fun just playing with the song because i can and i don't have to think about it like mm -hmm. because of the time and obviously i can do that with guitar and different things but but again that one is so embodied um yeah. and uh and the more you practice the more you're like you say you're able to imp improvise and, and and add in a fill here and that kind of stuff that and i think that it is a i don't want to use the word shame but it's a it is a travesty that the the idea of i think you said in the mormon church they called it vain repetition mm -hmm. in uh, baptist circles it gets called rote religion mm -hmm. as kind of this oh anything that that it's funny because you you started a, talking about it coming from the heart which is actually the impulse i think that they desire for that why they're, they're leery of of that is because they don't believe that anything repetitive can be of the heart oh. because if it's repetitive then it's not coming from you which is again you, go, harkens back to this hyper individualism that you kind of were poking on earlier yeah which is something i'm continuing you and i both were talking about or you were talking about how our journey's moving away to a health here's what i'd say it's not an either or it's about where these things fit like in a value system like you you mm -hmm. are a person yeah <laughs> you are an individual yeah, right, person right, but we are yeah. not only an individual person you know and, my identity is way larger than just my yeah, personality it, it, right yeah and yeah. and we are relationships we are a family yeah. we are a church and and we're a community and our life so it's like and that is we aren't just the the person and that's where i feel like where i've come from and i know probably in certain maybe aspects possibly of mormonism it's very ind individualistic yes right yeah and yeah yeah and that, and oh, good. that's just the the part of of being able like me having my individual extemporaneous original prayer is the only genuine form of prayer or something mm -hmm. as opposed to a prayer that was said by Jesus or a prayer that was, which that one gets grafted on. Okay. Well, we'll be okay with the Lord's prayer. Jesus said it, but, but the, but any other written prayer. And I do have a lot of value for that. Um, I, I do some things now, like uh, sometimes if I'm in like a group text with a group of people and there's like prayer asked, <laughs> I'll just Google a prayer that's mm -hmm. been written about that. It's not <laughs> right. And, and yeah. I'll, I'll just copy it into the the thing. So it's like, Here's something actual, you know, or or typing, sometimes typing a prayer out, even because I think that's more than I don't know, because it, then it's like there for the person in a right. way. Um, as a but some people might be like, well, that's weird and premeditated and you know, it's not genuine. Yeah. Do you know what I, you yeah. know what I'm saying? Like Yeah, that? yeah. No, definitely I feel the 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 tension and and I I the way I, I have just through experience, you know, learn, I mean, reading, I, I've prayed Psalm 50 or in King James. And, 51. Uh, yeah. 51, Psalm 51, mm -hmm. like hundreds of times, right? Like that's mm -hmm. part of our daily prayers. Yeah. And there's still little phrases that just like, you know, like, whoa, what was that? Right. Like mm -hmm. created me a clean heart, you know, and a right spirit, right? Like created me a, a clean heart and a right spirit. Like, wow. Like one time that just, that just hit me right in the heart, you know, like created me in a clean heart and a right spirit and cast uh, me not away. renew a right spirit within me. That's what it is. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy spirit from me. Right. Yeah. So it's like, man, like when, like, I, I just have to come back to the analogy of, of music just because you're playing a song that was written by someone else doesn't mean that it's not affecting you and it's not transforming you. That's part of the danger of playing <laughs> bad music, right? Mm. It affects you. It affects you because you're playing it, even though you didn't write it. 
and and you still bring your performance to it. You bring your experience to it. The way you play a song is going to be different than how I play a song. You know, and and part of your struggle, I think, is that you wanted everything to be to the click track, and you wanted everything to be uh, quantized, right? Yeah. And yeah. and you lose that human performative element, right? Like that. That's why. So in orthodoxy. Um, in the, some of the Greek churches have organs, but m most Orthodox churches don't have an organ. It's all just acoustic. Yeah. And the reason is that they use just intonation. So just intonation, just for, and I'm not a music theory guy, but as far as I understand, it, you're always singing in a way that you're in tune to each other. But because of that, it does not map directly to the Western scale because the Western scale is actually slightly out of tune in certain places in order to make all of the intervals even. Mm. So they're mathematically even, but they're actually out of tune slightly, like the chord of A is an example, right? Interesting. Um, and so Eastern music uses just intonation where there is someone droning and then everyone is matching to the drone. And everyone's staying in tune to the drone. And the way the music's written is that the drone moves. And then there's a melody as well. But the melody, it, but everything's staying in tune to each other, which would make it drift from a, an organ or from a piano. You would start drifting and being out of tune of the instrument. But orthodoxy, you know, said vocal is what we were given by God. So that's what we're going to use to worship him. And so rather than surrendering being out of tune in order to stay in tune with instruments we stay in tune with each other which means we're drifting so so the the a note from the beginning of the song is not the same as the a note at the end of the song because it stayed in tune the whole time well <laughs> that's a funny way to the 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 it's it a relative in, scale, right basically. well it yeah and to say it stayed in tune the whole time in the west you would say it increasingly became out of tune yes it drifted out of tune by staying in tune right? <laughs> well but everyone's together that's the thing everyone's staying together and yes. there's you know it's interesting sometimes that we have used uh digital, they're called pads and uh -huh. it's just like it's basically a drone yeah and, and so it gives you the key so that you're just like in that key yeah. and you can you can not be playing anything but it's just like a nice a, a ethereal sound that's just mm -hmm. it's droning mm -hmm. um it, but there are a couple of things that were interesting about where you interesting that you went to Psalm 50, 50 or 51 yeah, and right. uh, like, and I can, I can actually remember that song, that song very well because my wife and I recorded it and, um, and I can hear it like, and I have like a melody to it so that it's mm. like creating me a clean heart. Oh God. And I can mm. just like go with it because there's actually music attached to it. Yeah. And, yes. um, and so it's uh it's interesting these things together and but i think even when we recorded that we actually did record it with like just a drone and she just sang like just at one chord yeah and she just sang over that you know it's and it's actually called an antiphon which i don't i don't know if if they have i know it's a catholic thing i don't know if it's uh it's yeah that, we have similar yeah yes it's just but it's more of a chant i guess you yeah, could say yeah, and, right. um, yeah we have chant tradition yeah for sure and that's oh yeah <laughs> I have a, <laughs> the octo echoes right the octo echoes it's like the we have eight modes basically i have like one mm -hmm. chant and that's it but that's <laughs> uh, no, well that's a good one that's a good one <laughs> that's a good one and, to go yeah, yeah and i and, and i think you and i probably resonate with that psalm for similar reasons mm -hmm. our stories yeah. um yeah and that that is uh and it, it's interesting because that's actually one of my first podcast I did was with uh Kale Zeldin and we talked about that together that just that mm. that same yeah um so I don't know if anyone's out there and, and you haven't checked out like um Psalm 51 Psalm 50 if you're orthodox give it a good read so, and I'll I'll put a plug in on YouTube if you search for Psalm 50 or Psalm 51 in Aramaic there's mm -hmm. a performance of uh a monk and some other group from Georgia in Georgia, the com the country, not the state, mm -hmm. in Georgia when the Pope was visiting that country. And the oh. way there's a it's a young girl, she's like 15, and 
she's singing and there's a monk singing and they're kind of like singing the two main parts with a drone like a choir droning in the background one of the most musing moving pieces of music i've ever heard in my life like i don't know how the pope was not converted to orthodoxy by that. <laughs> <laughs> all, the, all the roman catholics were like ah! <laughs> the um I just yesterday or yesterday i got an email so i just had to release the conversation i had with graham pardon who's kind of he's been in orthodoxy a long time he's kind of mm. trying to figure he, he doesn't know if that's where he needs to be right now but uh he sent me this it's called um let me just look so i don't get this wrong um he sent me called sacred harp music which is out of appalachia it's a type of worship oh. Yeah, and uh, it's it's you know I guess a couple hundred years old. I think it originated out of Appalachia, mm -hmm. and it's it's him. It's a type of him song, but it's it's apparently it's got its own genre. But he was, but it's something. It's so interesting because I've I've been so attracted to pop for most of my life, and that yeah. is related to what you know I was talking about, like the the machine side of it. And I I still have, I'm still a big part of me. But I think, and I'm not just going to abandon that, but I think what I am being open to is seeing beauty um, in in a different, a different facet of music. Mm -hmm. Because something about pop or my experience with trying to execute is that there's actually, it's actually approaching music truth first, which is the whole Western thing right is 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 it true to the metronome is it true to the pitch is it true to and so it's 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 like a tyranny of truth and i even feel like mm. that represented my my spiritual struggle to a whole degree as well which was is it like when you were talking when the modern ideas like broke apart uh the literal or historicity of of scripture for many people that was that was a huge kind of like well if i can just know that what i believe is true if i can just know that the belief is true if i can and and i can mark that off as as being true to history or true you know like it's this yeah, idea yeah. that i think went it, it just was a huge spirit of of my life and yet i didn't know how to be truthful mm -hmm. and that created this like major dissonance that mm -hmm. I didn't understand because you can, I guess, uh, like you said, that you could have a true pitch, but and that's a certain type of trueness. Or, um, but, but you're, and you can believe and know that that's true, but that doesn't make you as a person a kind of a true person. Like, are are you in a true pitch of yourself of reality? Or, the, or is it very dissonant, which you even mentioned that earlier in the conversation, like, like there, there's a cognitive dissonance mm -hmm. there. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and that's, so that's been a big part of that. It's like, and, and I think it's probably related to more Eastern thought and realities is being able to, as a person, know if you are in, in or out of tune. Well, and you notice that by watching people around you right you okay. can't see yourself and what you know of yourself is mostly diluted like you're wrong right it's a story you tell yourself so if you start watching the reaction of people around you to you you start seeing who you really are mm. and i was blind to that for most of my life i ignored it on purpose because i was trying to emanate who i was from me as the source but it's reflected back to you in the faces of those around you hmm. and as you start to see that and open up to that that's where it starts getting really uncomfortable yeah. when you've been living delusionally right but yeah and i and i think this is tied to the shame as well that 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 dissonance where you know this is true and i'm not being truthful causes the shame and it undermines your integrity you're not you can't even trust yourself you well, you're know, not you lie, you lie to yourself right you're just you're not, not integrated even right you're not you're even integ person. integrity you know mm -hmm. you're not you're not integrated right 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 and that's and what causes the shame it causes dis disintegrated yeah exactly yeah exactly oh man yeah, yeah that was um 
and that's what I say. Obviously, that you can you can recognize that dissonance in relationship. I just felt like I've been able whenever it's I can acutely know whenever I've allowed that or a, a part of that or wanted to allow that to, to rest in me if I've done something close to or shameful on mm -hmm. um, that oh this is uh, this is what it's like to, to carry this inside of me again and now I don't feel integrated into my marriage or now I don't feel mm -hmm. integrated into my family you know I, I had this experience probably a year ago did something that I was ashamed of um, you know didn't cross certain lines that anyone would probably count as lines being crossed of, of doing something inappropriate, but, but that's, that's not the standard. The standard is like right. you know, the spirit or something or what you know is true. And, or you do, do you feel like this is something you want to hide from somebody? And, yep. and I did, I did, I didn't want it because I was ashamed of it. And when I came home, I could just feel the dis, I, I didn't, I could, I wasn't vulnerable. I was not in the same level of vulnerability with my family mm -hmm. because there was this thing that was that I was ashamed of. And that's how I know, like, man, this I have to be honest about this. Yeah. And that's um, you know, that's that's been a journey and a rhythm. And and I've shared this on here many times whenever uh talking about truth and these conversations is one of the well that confession is a spiritual practice yes and not only in the hierarchy of to the priest but to people you've transgressed Correct. you know and and so i think that and and that's why a lot of beauty um that one it's a wonderful practice within um you know step work and um is in the making amends uh, that type of thing but i definitely feel like it's been divorced in, by and large from in culture that the reason that we have therapists and that there's a great need for therapists is because um confession is divorced from the spiritual life yeah, in by and large by and large you know yeah. there's obviously you you have a priest that you can confess to and um yeah. and hopefully yeah, it, and, and then, orthodoxy, but... what's that I says part of orthodoxy, like yeah, to be to partake of Eucharist, you need to have confessed recently. Like for in our particular tradition, it's within the last four to six weeks, basically. Like the the Russians, they confess every week mm -hmm. before they receive. So, and I and I think that that is, and obviously in the in the West, there's still uh, priestly confessional, you know, op in certain places and stuff. I mm -hmm. I was told um one of my early podcasts too was with a guy named justin wells he's got a show uh, channel called justin's morning coffee and he's, mm. he kind of hangs around in the space some and he um he he was t doing like uh, plot lines and and documentary and he was relating them to truth and that and so he was going through these um kind of theological terms like this like confession and adoration or something and he was relating them back to um to documentary because he's a documentary filmmaker mm -hmm. as well and and he in that um in his video he was talking about how jung and freud wanted actually to create an army of confessors like saint maximus the confess is i think it's maximus the mm -hmm. confessor yep, yep. you know it's like that's what the confessor is somebody that you confess to right and and they were wanting to create a secular army of confess they wanted to steal that from the religious office yeah and now we have it. it's now it's it but it, what's so interesting is it's you know we 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 make these pretend divides that well like okay this isn't a religious practice this is psychology this is right no right. it's a religious practice yes right and it's and, what's inverted though it's inverted like therapy is inverted because what they're doing is trying to help you um come to peace with asserting yourself like being like who you are like your authenticity right it's all about authenticity and so there was that whole tension in sopranos where the psychotherapist is wrestling with this idea of i'm making i'm helping a mafia boss become a better more authentic mafia boss uh -huh. <laughs> yeah I, that's I would, the problem yeah. with it right that's the that when it's removed from the religious context 
that's what it turns into. Yeah, it, the because I, it probably depends on the theory that the practitioner is practicing whether or not it matters if this is an integrated person into a whole or just or my board just am I just looking at this individual and right. trying to just affirm or 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 affirm the individual I had I've I've done actually a lot of therapy um and it was it was also I mean it was I it's a it was a spiritual practice now my therapist was a, a Christian and mm. that was helpful for me for him to understand the world that I had you know the really framework that, that you yeah were. that's with you know and so but that 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 act and that practice actually was well i mean it was like that i just said oh that was my confessor mm -hmm. it's just operating in our in our fragmented world um and i mean even at times i feel like my wife is my confessor you know mm -hmm. or or i'm True. hurt and and that it's but it's not you know what i like about the idea and the reality of a hierarchical structure of like that it's not we we want to just say no that that's this but that's this no mm -hmm. that's my and it's like it this Peugeotian fractal reality it's like this yeah. is here this is here and this is here mm -hmm. and these things exist at all these levels and um and and they help when they when you're or you you're more in tune whenever you're they're operating um in in a in a and a healthy or a good or um and a beautiful hierarchy of 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 uh, reality and, and it's so, aligned right yeah it's an aligned reality it's an aligned hierarchy mm -hmm. you know and 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 that's kind of what i was explaining to my daughter yesterday well and well two things with that one is this is why truth can't be systematized yeah this is why you can't you, there's no code. You can't codify it, right? Yeah. You can't have 4.6.2 says don't ever do this, right? Uh, and and second, I was kind of talking with my daughter about this yesterday. We were talking about masculine and feminine, and she was like, um, kind of struggling with it because her her boyfriend's Mormon and he's 18 and he's, you know, being interviewed to get the higher priesthood in mormonism and she was trying to understand what that is and what it means and it's very different than how orthodox looks at priesthood you know and we were kind of talking through some of that and she goes well what qualifies him like if i was 18 years old in the mormon church what qualifies him to be the priest in the priesthood and me not and i was like well it's not that it's not qualification trust me <laughs> it's not that mm. but i said we started talking through masculine and feminine roles and masculinity and femininity you know, we talked about it in the church how, um, but but basically, I was just saying there are. I, I won't go into that whole TED talk, but the what I was, the 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 heart of it is that I have times in my life where I am in a masculine role. Like as a father, I am generally in a masculine role. Like I am, I am, and and we talked about the head and the body, right? And I was like, so what is more important to you, your head or your body? And she's like, well, I need both. I'm like, yeah, okay. So masculine is head, feminine is body. I said, so in the family, I'm the head and you and mom are the body. And we're all the body, right? But I'm the head part and you're the body part. And I said, but at work, my boss is the head and I'm the body. Mm -hmm. So he's masculine and I'm feminine in that role. It's a, it's a relational uh point of view of whether you're giving the ideas or receiving the ideas, whether you're spreading or gathering, right? My boss is saying, this is what we're going to do. And I gather the materials and make it happen. Right. I bring it into being. And I was like, that's, it's more like that. I was like, so masculine has a role and masculine is the priesthood because Christ was a priest is a priest. He's the high priest. That's why men are priests. And that's why priests are men because it's a masculine role, but our priest is in a feminine role to his Bishop and he's in a feminine role to Christ, but he's in a masculine role to his family and he's in a masculine role to his parish. Right. I was like, we're, we're all both. Mm. So there's not one that's more important than the other. You know, it's not a power struggle. 
it's just different roles, different modalities. And she was just like, oh, okay. Like it kind of helped her. We talked about chess, you know, with the king and the queen, you know, and she, it, that helped her see it as well. You know, how there's just different, different roles to play. You know, and I was like, and you can argue that the queen, I mean, the, there's no argument. The queen is the most powerful piece on the board, but you can kill the queen and the kingdom doesn't die because it's the kingdom, not the queendom. Mm. <laughs> right. So anyway, it, that, that's, that's what you're talking about. It's that fractal that goes up and down, you know, and, and, and I don't, I was in a conversation with Tigrog about it and I'm like, I'm not using fractal as like some magic word catch all. It's not that at all. It's that it's a, it's a relational formula that scales. It doesn't have a scale. That's what makes something fractal. Is it no matter what level you look at? And, and the example I use is at work. If I look at the output of one person, and if I look at the output of 10 people and put it together, or if I look at the output of the whole shop, the the graph looks the same the difference between the top and the bottom is the same magnitude no matter what if i'm looking at one person or the whole shop it it doesn't have a scale it's fractal and that's what happens in human situations when humans are outputting things they produce fractals they produce well they produce chaos <laughs> they produce a chaos theory right that's where chaos theory comes from but yeah. anyway pretty mathy but and i didn't mean to go down that road but i'm just what i'm just tying back to what you're saying with this fractal relationship right it yeah. works up and down the square it works up and down levels yes yeah. and and it you can see the reality of it it you know in all of the levels i guess yeah yeah and yeah yeah and that's yes, each level is a microcosm within itself it's a it's an embodiment of the reality you know, the whole, but it also yeah. participates in the other levels, right? And and the, oh, while I'm thinking of it, one other little clarification I want to make is that I I actually don't confess my sins to the priest. Part mm -hmm. of the ritual is that we're in front of icons. There's candles lit. I'm confessing my sins to Christ, mm -hmm. and the priest is acting as the witness. Mm -hmm. And then the priest, after my confession, will then give me spiritual counsel but I am not looking at my priest directly. He's mm. standing, he's sitting or standing next to me. That's so and interesting. I'm looking at an icon of Christ. I think that's, yeah, that's, I like that distinction because, um, that's acknowledging the reality of that's acknowledging the spiritual reality. And it's also acknowledging the human reality of the necessity to, um, well, to have that confession embodied. <laughs> yes, correct. In relationship, but also the way that you frame it in that it is it is ultimately a confession to God. And yeah. that um I, I yeah, I think that's really interesting. I hadn't hadn't thought about it that way. Um I'm glad I mentioned that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because uh, you it got, is well, an important distinction. It's and I would wonder if that's, you know, an Eastern and Western distinction between, you know, like having a confessional versus, you know, and if that's right. So I would still venture to say in my belief where I stand that I think that the practice that it, the embodied practice of it is important. I agree with you. And, and so even, you know, even if, even if that's not orthodox in the <laughs> way to do it, um, and, and and that's and that's the thing. No, that you I, need to do it in to, to your family and to your friends and to the people and to your boss. I mean, there's a scripture, right? Like before you approach Christ, run to your brother and mm -hmm. make amends with him, right? Yes. Like before you come to the Eucharist, like if you've got a problem with someone in your family, you shouldn't be partaking of the Eucharist. If you've got a problem with your boss, you should not be partaking of the Eucharist. You should reconcile that first. And that's the interesting thing about peace. And you, even going back to your first experience in the, in your church was that, that call to peace yeah, to come in to, to and, and that is, that is that reconciliation, peace with God, peace with yeah. yourself, peace with your, your brother, peace with your, your wife or your spouse. And, yeah. and that, that's just a, well, it's a painful journey to get there. Um, but it yeah. is, um, gosh, it's worth it. it and yeah. You know, when I was, I remember, you know, when I was living that uh, 
incongruent life when I was living that duplicitous, duplicitous life. And I, I was reading an article and it's like, because I, there were times like I, I wanted to be free from that. Mm. But, um, I, th I thought that the cost was too much and someone I was reading someone saying you have to tell the truth and I was like I just can't do that mm -hmm. I just can't I mean that it's it will cost too much right and it probably did <laughs> I mean, yeah. It really did. yeah but not but not at the but not at the expense of um of the opportunity for something good to happen um right ultimately but yeah it was a seed for a new life right like mm -hmm. it was you burned down the old life and there was the seed of a new life was still there and it didn't get yep. burned. Yeah. And, and I'm, and maybe even there was still a foundation and that's, and I think that's, that's at least part of my story is, um, I felt like maybe there was, this was, you know, everything fell down to the foundation mm -hmm. and I, I still feel like that, that foundation was that solid rock or that, um, but that, and you know to take that that's that scripture build the wise man builds his house upon the rock you know and i don't know if i would say that there's more to that where i mean the foundation must be set but that you can also build a house that is more true and more integrated and more beautiful on top of that foundation with with the the goodness of god helping helping you frame that more yeah because it's level and square now and it's going to stand right like before you had a good foundation but but it's like building it with like hodgepodge crooked, yeah. yeah yeah crooked lumber and 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 yeah. and um you know and, and hidden rooms and and mm. hidden passages between rooms yeah. and and now you know it's a it's a beautiful open room it's a beautiful open building and, yeah, and there's a difference that. yeah you know so so this actually relates into what I was really interested in talking with you about. Um, and, and this has been a great conversation. Don't get me wrong. This has been <laughs> really great. I didn't know. Uh, yeah, it's like, oh, okay, now we can actually talk about what I want to talk about. No, it's not like that. But I, I'm just saying this leads into something that I was thinking about yesterday with regard to you. So, so I'm going to come out of this. It's going to sound a little weird at first, but I think I can tie it together. So when I in part of my deconstruction stage, I was learning about magic and I was learning about how they do magic and how magic spell is cast and how you both, both uh, from an occult point of view and from just like performance point of view, like what a magician does, right? A magician is trying to misdirect your attention all the time. Mm. And a magician is trying to turn off your filters, right? So a magician is trying to confuse your filters or turn off your filters. And then, and that's hypnosis as well. So I was learning hypnosis as part of magic. And one thing I learned in there is that there's two ways to turn off someone's filters, ultimately, or or at least in the in the hypnosis world. One, you either, and especially a group of people, if you want to put a group of people, make them suggestible, you either rile them up emotionally through repetition and through loud, overpowering experiences, or you lull them into a state of being almost asleep where they're barely awake or barely asleep. And in my experience of mega churches or, you know, the Pentecostal experiences I had, it was that whip them up through repetition, you know, boom, 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 boom. And you're building this up. And then everything you're saying is just sliding right past any kind of conscious filter you have. Right. That's where people are singing and they're chanting over and over and over. And you are slipping past the conscious filter. Right. So, so like mainstream Christians say that they don't, they're not into rote religion, but that's rote religion. I mean, you're all reading the same words on the screen and saying the same things and with the music and the lighting and the, you know, all the, the theatrics with that. Now the Mormons take the other approach. The Mormons, you walk in and everything's quiet and subdued and they're playing quiet music and you sit down and they start the, the beginning of their service is the, sacrament the bread and the, the water and it's all very reverent it's all very quiet it's all very somber there's very there's no talking while they're passing that you know they say the prayers and there's no talking while they're passing the sacrament around so you're already in a you're you're getting into a very quiet state and then speaking from experience of standing up to speak to people after so it's like 20 minutes of practical silence and stillness 
then you stand up to speak and you start to speak and people are nodding off all over the place. Right. And I try to be kind of an animated person who, you know, gets involved, gets like, I'm an enthusiastic person. And I, you could usually get people kind of woken up and involved again in participating, but even the, even the physical posture of sitting in a pew and looking up at a speaker is an uncomfortable state for a human to be in with your eyes. And that's what they use in hypnosis to put you into hypnosis. They have you look up and it's only a very short amount of time before you start getting sleepy and then you become suggestible, right? So just that physical posture puts you into a suggestible state, whether how much of this is contrived, I don't know from the Mormons. I can't speak to that because I haven't been involved in those high level discussions, but I'm just saying those techniques are effective. So all of that to say my spirituality or what was called spirituality or what was called the Holy spirit in those environments was very much looking back feels much more confused with one artifice and, and I'm not saying Orthodox doesn't have their own technologies. Of course they do. They have the incense, you're standing, everyone's looking together. There's the call response. There's the singing. There's the, um, there's, you know, repeating the Nicene Creed, repeating the Lord's Prayer. We're all doing that together. That's all technology too. I'm not, but I am saying you're standing and it's much harder to fall into a suggestible state when you're standing mm -hmm. for a long period of time. But that aside, I guess where I'm coming from is, for me, it's been, it was very hard for me to start pulling apart emotionality and sentimentality from spirituality, because for me, they had been very conflated, uh, you know, like not so much in their church services, but like I said, Mormons love Disney and they love musicals and they bring that approach to their art and to their spiritual art and, and to their performances. And that that overpowering emotionality gets confused for spirituality for them. And for me personally, I was confused by that. And it's only now after being in a more subdued and more ritualized and more embodied practice that those are starting to be kind of teased apart. And I was wondering about your experience coming at it from like, I came from the subdued fall. Everyone falls asleep into a trance and all of the stuff's going into the filter. You're come from the other spiral up kind of practice, the tradition and practice. And I'm wondering what it's been like for you to tease apart that, or if you agree with what I'm saying, if, if this resonates at all, if this is something that you've thought about or, or something that, that you have started to work through in, in trying to rebuild your spirituality. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Um, so three things. Um, the you mentioned the Disney relationship to Mormonism, something that I think w within large parts of mm -hmm. certain parts of conservative evangelicalism, it, it brings to mind the artist uh, Thomas Kincaid. Mm -hmm. uh, right. And when I I actually had an interesting experience with his art. I, I was able to to discern that he was an addict through his art not, without knowing it. Um, Ooh. And that was because of my own addiction. But it, it, it gave me a lot of compassion for him. But when, when I actually had a moment to mention that to Jonathan Peugeot when I was at Symbolic World. He goes, I don't like Thomas Kincaid, <laughs> which a lot of people don't. He's like, because it's affectatious. Which I didn't really know what that meant, but I think it yeah. has something to do with uh, it using something disingenuously to to receive a type of kind of like what you're talking about yeah and and, and so um and what i mean i didn't discern i i didn't discern that he was an addict necessarily i was just able to discern my own addictive addictiveness by seeing his viewpoint on not being in a vulnerable being outside of intimacy and vulnerability Mm. in most of his work mm -hmm. um that was a huge realization for me having about <clears throat> two years ago i was like actually after after a therapy session dealing with something deeply meaningful related to a relationship in my life that i was i recognized that that was a disconnect for that person but i could only recognize it because it was it had been a disconnect for me mm. 
So, um, I that's a part of the answer to that. Um, the other parts were so coming from the the Baptist um, space of mega church. I do think that there is a distinction between that part of mega church versus say something that's real that's more closely tied to the charismatic and Pentecostal sides of that there. I think there is distinction there in, in how um, those technologies are used mm. more to more greater and lesser degrees with, within those cultures. Now on face value, you could listen to a song that's come out of Bethel and you could listen to somebody at passion, which those would loosely represent, um, these, these like something more Baptist and something more Pentecostal, like or charismatic. Sure. Um, and they ultimately have diff, uh, some different telos that drives what they're doing. But, mm. you know, it's a rock song with cool lights. <laughs> like, yeah. but I, I think that if you go and experience those cultures, you're actually, they're, you're going to, they're going to be distinct on certain levels. Yeah, um, that's right. Yeah, that's right. And, and so, and I say this as somebody that's, you know, pretty, <laughs> uh paid attention to these things so it's not like uh i'm gonna my my answer is gonna be a little more technical on that aspect of that's it. fine yeah and no so, I, I appreciate that so the so to that point is i think back to being 15 and i went to this church camp as a baptist church camp and there was a rock band and this was like the year 2000 and um and you know, these guys were, they're young, they were in their twenties. They're not trying to, they don't have an agenda. They didn't have an agenda as a rock band that, that this camp had hired to lead these worship songs to manipulate like that, that they were like, mm -hmm. they wanted to come lead kids to worship God. Like yeah, like, genuine intent is what you're saying. It's, so it's not like, it's not artifice that, that way. Right. Yes. And, and for me as a 15 year old that I think that I, I, I can recall this, very explicit realization in my in the singing and the worship time about my state as a as a as a as a human before God, you could say mm -hmm. um, that I was kind of broken and that God was the creator of all things and and somehow th you know through Jesus like he helps make this broken person be loved and be able to connect with God. I, I, I would, that's how I maybe would describe it. It was a very, it was a very real experience in that milieu of, of rock music. And it obviously affected me greatly because yeah, that's what I devoted it affected to your career. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My life too. Yeah. So um, with a genuine desire to do that and be a part of that and continue that and help that. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to acknowledge that. And, and but but not you know thinking about it psychologically. I think about it psychologically now, and that's where I think where the conversation that we're that to the point that you're coming to, and that in that it matters. Mm -hmm. Um, how how and and why and what our intent and and how these things are being done. It's not and I and I would so I would say in the Baptist world because it is supposed to because. Because uh, religion isn't attached to form, supposedly it's attached to the heart. Then mm -hmm. technically, it doesn't matter how you do the music. Uh, it, it the form doesn't matter technically. Mm -hmm. Theologically, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Even though people were pissed whenever these teenagers started trading rock songs for their hymns, it did mm -hmm. matter. But they mm -hmm. but the argument couldn't be made based on. Uh, tradition as as a reason why this needs to stay you can't argue for tradition because you you say you've rejected it yeah yeah you say it doesn't matter only the heart matters and these kids hearts really care about this so it's like you it's like you it's like the younger generation took it's like they called the boomers bluff and like took it to the logical conclusion, right? Like, Oh, okay. Yeah, we can do that. <laughs> well, you, but you don't know you're doing that. You just, right. like, it's yeah. meaningful to me and you don't, and the hymns were meaningful to the 60 year old out there, but I didn't understand why he couldn't understand why this wasn't good because yeah. look at these kids were excited about God. Right. And, 
And so, but is excitement the aim? I think that's where I'm coming from. Well, right? yeah, I agree with you, and I think that yeah. that's where I would say that that's a misplaced on like, um, I where I come from now is like I think I think that like where I stand right now, like rock songs about God on a Friday night would actually be really awesome. <laughs> <sighs> and and then like keep climbing up that hill or keep climbing down into a more sacred that 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 my spiritual life had and and this idea of like i was having this conversation because i i do think that that's an important conversation of teasing apart i can't remember the exact words you said but like spirituality from emotionality or sentimentality okay yes and that is where here's how i've tried to explain it um in in this conversation is in my previous state or if you go to so and so given big mega church or you know protestant church that are trying to like enact this contemporary thing on a sunday morning and a lot of it does have to do with sentimentality because that was that's another piece of this spirit that my experience with it which is oh look at susie Su <sighs> susie's up there singing you know, and it's just, and it's awful. I mean, it's, it's objectively awful. Mm -hmm. Man, her heart. We just love her heart. And so then I was at this dissonance for me as wanting mm -hmm. to be a professional musician. Right. Like, Where well, you're that, all about execution, right? But and, and for something to, like, kind of point, you know, like, there's, a, there's also a part of where I think this, this conversation, teasing apart, is about the experience of transcendence that, that people are aimed for in that rock milieu is 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 a transcendent experience mm -hmm. so i'm like well this you know sally's not creating a transcend transcendent <laughs> experience she's creating a sentimental experience yes. uh, to that point and i'm not you know again like it's like are we talking about right and wrong right now i not necessarily no no but, i'm not so, so i'm but, just like learning how to make the distinction yeah, right? yeah and i think it's important and i think it's one that i've wrestled with these are real life examples, you know, that I'm saying like, yeah, well, okay. You're, I'm getting paid to be a musician basically every week, but there's a certain contingent of people that say the music doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Only the heart matters. And can you yeah. imagine that as your craft, as your profession, it's like, what do I, what the hell am I supposed to do with that? Like, <laughs> do I just suck on purpose or do I just not care about getting better? Right. And, yeah so, you know so here's an interesting tie there's a so iconography in orthodoxy right it's a long tradition and it's beautiful and the more you learn about it the more subtle it is and the more beautiful it is and the more depth there is to it right like it just starts opening up there was a i read of a church in ukraine where their church had been burned down and mm -hmm. they had to move the parish to a new building and there were no icons all the icons had been lost in the fire mm -hmm. and the parish priest had the the kids draw mm. the icons. so he had you know the children drew a picture of christ and a picture of theotokos and a picture of john the baptist and, and he put those up on the iconostasis right and i think this is kind of where you're where you're coming from it's like it's a different form of expression at a different level, but also contains an innocence. You know, when, when someone is singing from their heart poorly, there is an innocence there and a beauty there that cannot be achieved with a metronome or the metronome actually kills it. Yes. Right. And however, there is also something to be said about the Pantocrator from Mount Sinai that is one of the oldest icons we have that is one of the most profound paintings you'll ever see because the right-hand side of God is very different than the left-hand side of God. And the more you spend time meditating on that and looking at that and seeing what that means and start tying that into your own spirituality, it opens up a lot of doors as well, right? So I don't think that they're... Mutually exclusive. Yeah, yeah, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. It, it, they're just two different expressions yes. of spirituality, right? And that has been where 
the when the artist so you think about the sistine chapel or you think about michelangelo's david or these sculptures like yeah. that's what i'm starting to like point to when i think about okay where how it's operating in large scale in western evangelicalism right now is that the artist is at the top of the hierarchy mm. and that's how it happened in the sistine chapel and then you mm -hmm. you give this example of that church where the children drew the, the 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 icons yeah um and again at some point i bet that those got painted over and they and, did yeah they it, were it, eventually it, replaced and so that's like a they took the place and they were used in worship right mm -hmm. like, yeah and and so <clears throat> there are pieces there there is a but maybe there's an ideal that we you know and these are dangerous and and that's in the sense of Plato and all that kind of stuff that I'm kind of wading into with, with this conversation is, is really dancing with those ideas of, of the perfections and versus a complete embodiment. Yeah. And, and that these perfections sometimes give you a tell us to like aim for that mm -hmm. creates things that the human looks at or experiences as something transcendent. Honestly, yes. when you look at, even within iconography, but that there's an excellence to the craft that yeah. you can recognize, or even yeah. all of art, there that when the craft is done at a certain level, it it does offer a real type of transcendent experience. Yeah. That is something though that's also separate, I think, from spirituality, but that is like you to your point, very much uh mixed up in our culture. Mm -hmm. And I and that is something that I'm continue that I mean it was several months ago it was on um, a live stream that was talking about worship and that was something for me it was like that that we are but the, but that's even part of the transcendent nature of walking there into a sacred space that the architecture creates a type of transcendence but what is yeah. the what what is sacred though and so I was trying to get to this illustration earlier is something like um, the difference that you feel between if say a drummer's cymbal knocked over or or a singer's microphone stand fell down you know that would be distracting a little uncomfortable mm -hmm. and you know maybe upsetting to the performer but you know you everyone kind of like yeah it stuff happens mm -hmm. if a priest trips and knocks over the eucharist that's a big problem <laughs> so you are, that's sacredness yeah that is that is sacred right. the music stuff falling over that is um you know unfortunate or distracting or right. but it's not like it's not like that there was some sacred sacredness was violated right although and, you could do that you could sing poorly on purpose in a distracting and terrible way right sure but yeah. it's not the same level of infraction yeah i would agree it's not the same it, level of violation right yeah because it's because ultimately a microphone falling over in a rock performance is not necessarily um disrupting a sacred act right, right. yeah i would agree with you and right. so yeah. but what we will attribute that that as worship as well that's just a, that's just i mean well it's worship and then that's worship i was like oh, i actually i think that one is um and we want to say that we i mean and worship music is kind of a sacred cow mm -hmm. and but it's not um i i think that there's i think that there's something more to approaching worship with um with the idea that there's something sacred happening and i and, and that, that that is connected to the word sacrament because yeah. um and so when you when you disembody worship from sacredness and sacramental realities, mm -hmm. like you not say, you're actually saying, well, ultimately it doesn't matter if the microphone microphone falls to the ground because it's the only thing sacred is between like God and and my heart, mm -hmm. not anything in this Around. space. Yeah. So that to me is is really the the giant disconnect is that line mm. of sacramentality. Yeah. And that's, so that, that's insightful. Yeah. And yeah. so heaven 
people do have a type of embodied transcendent experience that that is okay. Well, I experienced God. And I would say that I've had something like that, Yeah. but there's a difference between religious practice and, re and, 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 uh, a sacred ceremony, mm -hmm. um, where you are, where something is being done that is, um, And we're calling it as such that something being done is a sacred act, the yeah. sacred act of confession, the sacred act of marriage, the sacred act of baptism, the sacred act of um, of uh, of of Eucharist or communion with God. And that idea of communion with God is is a actual connection to actual uh, material. It's a sharing of a meal, it, but it but it's it's and it's you're eating the body and blood of Christ, right? It's, like, it's the sharing John of the meal, but it right. but it's physically and psychologically yes. and physiologically touching your lips and your taste yes. buds and being yes. digested and yes. being becoming taken. part of you. Christ is becoming part of you, literally, physically. So that and psychologically, right? that yeah. psychologically is is a. Mm -hmm. uh, you talked about psychotechnologies and all these things. That mm -hmm. is where I've come from. Is that and when mm -hmm. that is the telos of worship psychologically it does something very different than the telos being preaching and the telos being songs mm, wow and so or the telos yeah. ultimately in evangelicalism being the message which is to to share the evangelize evangelica that mm -hmm. is to evangelize so that the the telos is ultimately is to tell this tell the story which is not a bad it's not evil like that's the other thing about these music's not evil i don't even think rock music's evil I, I think I, but I don't think that they are, they hold enough meaning because mm. they aren't sacred enough. Mm. Yeah, they, and they aren't, and yeah. they aren't, um, <clears throat> so that's where I'm at now. I'm not at a church. <laughs> that, well, so it, these I things want, take time to work out, right? It's not right, Paul, easy. Paul Vanderclay, right? <laughs> yeah. No, it's just complex. This stuff takes time to work out, but, but it, I think these conversations help though. So that's, I don't know how that hits you. That's kind of, no, yeah, no, that's really interesting because, you know, and it, it relates to something. <clears throat> I remember our archbishop came to visit um, a couple of years ago. And, and one thing he mentioned really stuck with me. He said, because we were talking about prayer. I asked him about prayer. Like, how do you know that you're truly praying? Was mm -hmm. my question. And he said, well, there's, there's two kinds of prayer that you need to learn you have a private prayer and then you have public prayer and in your private prayer, you're trying to create as an ideal of the space as possible for you to not be distracted. Right. So that's why we have the icons in a prayer corner and we have a specific place in our house. Like in our house, we have a room that's a separate room that we only use for prayer and we go in there and, you know, I'll go in there and study scriptures and stuff too, but, but it is a prayerful spot. It's a prayerful place so that when you go in there, you are going into a physical location that's it's set sacred. apart. It's sacred. It's sacred. It is. It's yeah. sacred. And and you go in there and, and there's everything, all the distractions have been removed so that you can focus. And it's silent. It's quiet. Right. And and that's a, a certain kind of prayer. However, there's also the prayer of, <clears throat> yes, you go into a church and the architecture and the icons and the incense and the music is all there to help you pray. It's there to help you get into a prayerful state. However, you also have uh, <clears throat> distracting people. You have people moving around. You have kids on the floor, like, because there's no pews. That means kids are, <laughs> especially, you know, we have a, a, a pretty young parish. We have a lot of young people and a lot of children and a lot of babies. So there's crying, there's crying babies, there's children. And you have to learn to pray there too, hmm. right? There's a public prayer that you have to learn. You have to learn how to connect with Christ in your heart and not be distracted by all of the not prayer things going on. Right. And that's kind of the higher, more difficult level, but you're aided by a lot more aids. There's a lot more things going on in a church than there is in my little prayer corner that kind of help offset that. Right. <clears throat> and, and I think this is related to kind of what you're saying, where there's different levels of participating in that, sacred act and in the sacramentality of the world and i agree with you like a friday night concert is cool right um uh and then you know you go to a friday night concert rock concert and then you know saturday 
morning you get up and say your prayers and then saturday evening you go to vespers and if you're russian orthodox you go to confession and then and and then you go to vigil and then the next morning you get up and say extra pre-communal prayers to get ready for communion and then you go to orthros which prepares you for divine liturgy and then divine liturgy the whole thing is building up and and the tone is really somber and the and reverent and quiet and then once and then during when the gifts come out and and people are communing it's all there's quiet hymns being sung and then when it goes back when it goes back into the altar the whole tone changes and everything is thanksgiving and joy and celebration and and it, it's this whole wave of it's the cycle of basically going through the psalter too where you're just going through the hu the whole human experience of you know the, the and it starts with the saturday night vigil of you know and it can include the friday night concert right like i have no problem with that because that's the whole reason we fast the whole reason we fast is to enjoy the feast because both parts of those are part of being, I mean, it's not the only reason you fast, but I'm saying both aspects of that are part of being human, right? Both aspects, the fasting and the feasting. The problem in America is that every day is an all-you-can-eat buffet. It's yeah. only feast. There is no fast. Yeah. And that's why we're all gluttonous, and that's why we're all overweight, and that's why we're all consumers. We've been yeah. programmed into being consumers, right? And that carries over into our spiritual life. Yeah. You know, I, I've, you know, when I first became Orthodox, first thing I did was buy 50 icons and 500 Orthodox books, you know? <laughs> so now I have like three bookshelves of Orthodox books and I've read like you 10 consumed. of them. <laughs> you I consumed. did. I consumed spirituality. I tried to. Yeah. But then you sit down and try to read it and you're like, whoa, this is yeah. too much. It's like eating a very rich cake and you're like, well, I'll just have one bite and that's good for me for the day. <laughs> you know, and I have all these other books. I can't even touch them because it's too rich. There's too much there you know because i've also learned how to fast yeah and that's that's pointing on to instead of saying that okay i've got to becoming this if, if i if i can become this it's overnight we believe that we can like take it and, and it's like but really life is a journey and yeah. and we're not being taught not the, the fasting to a degree is all is, is seems like also a a lesson in patience you know yes. that we are we want uh, everything now and, and those and it it helps buff against that man we're coming up on time do you have any other okay. like closing thoughts you're you're thinking or wanted to say or anything no like i just i just wanted to say well and, and I, I will repoint you back at kind of maybe contemplating this this idea of when you get into those emotional raptures mm -hmm. separating the emotional rapture from a spiritual experience and they don't always have to be separate, right? Like, I'm not saying that they're not the same, but yeah. I'm saying that they're frequently confused. Yes. And especially for me, and especially I think both of our backgrounds lend to a confusion there. And I think it's an interesting thing to really contemplate and to try to separate out and at least make them distinct. They don't have to be, they're not mutually exclusive. I'm not saying that. But I think it is interesting to start trying to tease out yes. how do I experience, do I need to whip myself up into this emotional state in order to be able to experience the spirit or to know the spirit? And and I, the more I'm in orthodoxy and participating in divine liturgy, the less it seems that I need an ideal environment in order to participate in a, and, and I think I've, my definition of having a spiritual experience has definitely broadened and moved away from those, you know, those ultra call moments, right? Because Mormons yeah. have those too. Those Mormons gotcha. have the ultra call moment where, you know, oh, there's somebody in the room and needs to confess. Come on down. I know you're here. You know, like that, that's kind of like hacky in my opinion, right? It's like, well, it's definitely, it, yeah, it's definitely, there's, um, yeah, I, I I I join you in that in that journey, kind of away from that, and not always knowing what to do with with the past, but not also necessarily wanting to demonize it at the same time. No, 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 right? Yeah, no, and, and I'm I, not saying that no, at I, all. Right? I don't think you are. I think I'm yeah. like I'm joining you in that, and yeah, you're um, integrating it. Yeah, man, right? you're integrating it, but but also bringing it into proper order, into its proper place, right? Yeah, that's that's why you know. 
we so so a fun example would be like so we have the divine liturgy uh and you had the concert on friday but i'm saying like a lot of times uh during agape meal which is like after divine liturgy is all done we go downstairs and there's the fellowship hall and the food comes out and maybe some alcohol comes out if we're not on a fast and the instruments come out you know and yeah. there's we've got yeah. very talented folk musicians in our parish who you know are playing um bluegrass for us right it, and that's part it, of the it, celebration it is I, and i and i love that yeah jeremy thanks for being here today we're gonna close this out and that sounds uh, great this has been a real pleasure really this this was it went really deeper and, and it has been a much more meaningful journey than i was anticipating so i really appreciate you talking with me all right man i'm glad to hear it hey guys thank you so much for tuning in and staying with us till the end of today's episode your support and digital connection is deeply meaningful to me if you enjoyed our conversation and believe that these conversations being re bring a real value to your life in this space, please consider liking the video, subscribing to the channel. By doing so, you'll be helping me reach the goal of 500 subscribers, where we can continue building TLC, this little corner of the internet, as a sub-community. My hope is to be able to further cultivate digital community on this channel, to be a space where kindred souls can engage in deeper, more intimate discussions and allow space for more private monthly yours truly small group conversations. In the future, I hope to expand this endeavor further, taking yours truly conversation craft out on the road to have meaningful embodied dialogue with individuals from various corners of the corner. Together, let's continue to build spaces that further foster connection, growth, and understanding around deeply meaningful realities. Thank you again for being a part of this journey. Hi, this is Christian Baxter, and you're listening to Yours Truly, a place we go to think out loud.